thank you so much for everyone for coming out today. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm honored. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the book, but maybe to kind of set it up, I'll describe how the book sort of came to be. Um, I was actually starting to research after my, my TED talk on the post-crisis consumer. We set out to write a book about what people want. And as a researcher, I started to get deep into this topic. And what we started to see was a lot of the questions that people were talking about in terms of life. I started to notice, I started to think, well, geez, it seems like a lot of these traits and values seem more feminine, the things that people wanted. They wanted more empathy out of their leaders. They wanted more collaboration and sort of less politics and posturing. And the other really big thing they wanted was less sort of command and control thinking and sort of more open candor and more dialogue. And so I started to go, well, this, this might be something. And I got a chance to speak at, um, at an event hosted by uh, Denise Morrison. She's the CEO of Campbell's Soup. And uh, I was at an event somewhat like this, and she was basically helping to mentor and guide young professional women through their levels of, of their career. And there was so much energy and so much positive sort of enthusiasm. I tried to picture what it'd be like if there were 60 guys in the same room, <laughs> and if you'd get the same effect. So it was kind of like Newton hitting an apple on my bald head, and I thought, well, maybe there's something to this idea. So we basically went out and we started with the data, and we researched uh, 13 countries around the world. It's about pretty much two-thirds of global GDP. And um, we asked them a lot of questions about life today, about what makes them happy, what gives them their meaning. And there was a lot of mistrust in corporations. And there was, underneath this, was sort of what we called this global referendum on men. And the interesting thing about it was, you know, the majority of people around the world were dissatisfied with the conduct of men. But the really interesting thing was, is a lot of the men were dissatisfied with the conduct of men. And when we started to unpack it, what we started to see was that people were actually frustrated with the way things are, right? The structures in business, the structures in politics, um, and very pronounced. Like in Japan, 79% of Japanese men were frustrated with the conduct of men. So we started to you know, say that, well, okay, that's what's happening. There's this sort of challenge. And yet another big data point we had was two-thirds of people around the world thought the world would be a better place if men thought more like women. And I've known that for 20 years. So I've been married for 20 years, and that's this key to a long marriage. But Michael, my co-author and I, who are both um, dads in all female households, we thought, well, yeah, we understand this, but that's not really like deep research, right? So what we did is we set out to really explore this concept, and that was where the Athena Doctrine kind of got born. And um, what we did is we started by going back to our data, and we asked 64,000 people around the world to classify 125 different human traits as either masculine or feminine or neither. That was half of our sample. But the other half of the sample, we asked them to talk about solving today's challenges, right? What are the challenges we need? What do we need to be an effective leader, to be a modern leader, to be part of, of today's world and what's gonna make us happier in our lives? And so what we did is we started to model that data together and we started to see that what you would have expected to be the definition of a modern leader the least correlated with modern leadership was aggression and pride. Least correlated, right? To me, that's like the image of the prototypical CEO, right? The things that were most correlated with leadership were selflessness, empathy, collaboration, sharing credit, flexibility. These things became sort of these guiding tenets of, of what the Athena Doctrine is about. Now there were some male qualities that were still really important. People thought being resilient and decisive was more masculine. But it really what this was about was the balancing of these sort of ideas. Now, all of us have them inside us, men and women. We can all you know, do these things. We can all be more selfless and collaborative. The problem is in business, that doesn't really exist. In large part around the world. It's still very much this sort of man's way of thinking. And so really what the book is about is about really clarifying and really championing these vital aspects of feminine values and characteristics that are guiding the new economy. And so what we did is we stepped back with all this data and we traveled the world. So we spent two years traveling to 26 different cities in 18 different countries. I had hair when I started the project. <laughs> and what we did is we had all this data, but we wanted to really go out and understand how people are leading. And we met incredible, innovative men and women that were basically using these skills, these spectrum of feminine, masculine thinking. 
And a couple big themes that emerged. But the first thing that emerged is that these people had already figured out that we live in a social world, right? The fact, the very fact that we have this Athena networking event today, right? People understand now how to network, how to be more collaborative, how to share credit. We also live in a very open and transparent world where candor and honesty and authenticity are really in short supply. In our data from Young and Rubicam's BAV, trust in corporations has gone down by 50%, right? And so there's emphasis for more authenticity and more candor. And then there's this other big important trend where you see millennial values, young, what we call 20-somethings in the US, they're coming into the workplace in droves and they want social, socially meaningful work and they want to have their voices heard. So we started to look at all these trends around the world and we started to see that there were these really innovative people that were already recognizing um, this new world that had occurred. So I'll tell you a couple of stories about a, about a few of them. They're all in the book and the way the book opens up is there's sort of the the data to set up the idea, and then it's just stories of our travels all over the world, meeting all these great people. But um, the first thing is, it is an attitude, it's not an age. So we met um, in Jerusalem the president of Israel, President Shimon Peres, and he gave us 15 minutes of his time in his office, and he said something I'll never forget. He said, we're in a new world with many old minds, and the task of a leader is to adapt yourself that he's 90 years old, and he had just come back from Facebook. He'd spent time with Sheryl Sandberg and Mark Zuckerberg, and he was like, wow, this internet, social media is a big thing. <laughs> um, but he went on to talk about how multinational corporations, how governments are going to need to be more accountable in this social sort of open world. And we saw tremendous interest in governments to adapt in different ways. We spent time freezing to death in Reykjavik in March, <laughs> interviewing the framers of the first crowdsourced constitution in Iceland. There, you know, bankers had inflated a bubble that destroyed um, the national economy. And because Iceland is so small, literally everyone was affected. And so the government had really, really dealt with this in a poor way. So they got together working and using all the social media tools to crowdsource this draft of a new constitution. So collaboration was a, was a huge trend that we saw around the world. But so was this idea around empathy. So we saw empathy in very big frames, and we saw it in really interesting new models with startups. And one of my favorite interviews uh, from the book uh, is up in the British countryside, where we interviewed a granny. Her name is Holly Jones. She's Granny Holly. And she's one of the platoons of grandmothers that so handcrafted um, scarves and hats for this British startup called Granny's Inc. You have to check it out, it's grannysinc.co.uk. And it's a huge hit with millennials in London because what you do is you go on the website and the first thing you do is you pick out your own granny. <laughs> and your granny then basically knits a scarf and a, or a hat for you. And usually what the grannies do is that they sew little messages of hope and inspiration. And so you have this like emotional customer service. The grannies ship the package, it's all handmade, you know, hand packaged. And so as I was talking to Holly as she was knitting, she said a lot of her customers have asked her, you know, for cookies. And she said she draws the line at cookies, but she has developed these pen pal relationships. And I think it's just important when you step back because the, the idea in this startup that's become so popular is just a real simple idea. Granny's ink, there's wisdom in the wool. And so underneath this business are these concepts of legacy, of teaching, of empathy that we're just embodying into a business to differentiate uh, a startup from a whole bunch of other startups that were out there. So it was those types of themes that, that we saw around the world. A couple of others, we saw a really interesting theme around um, collaboration and guiding new business models to disrupt sort of old models. And many of the people that, that we met were guiding new forces in one instance or another, and one that I thought was really interesting was in education. And I met a man named Shai Rashef, who's the founder of University of the People. And it's the first tuition-free online university. And what's really remarkable is that 80% of his students are in the bottom 20% of GDP producing countries. These are young people that are studying in, in internet cafes, on first generation iPhones, often in war-torn regions, but they want to get a high quality education. And what he did is he connected 
to the compassion and empathy of teachers. Does anyone have a teacher in their family? What do teachers want to do? Help everybody. They do, right? They want to teach. My mom's a teacher. She's still teaching me. I'm like, like, you could have used a different phrase in that book. I don't know if that was a passive pronoun or something. I'm like, all right. But teachers want to teach. And so what Shai did is he went around the world and he has gathered 2,500 university professors from the most amazing colleges around the world to teach these, these students. It's all free, right? And so one of the stories he tells about is a young man named Zhou Jing who was studying in a tent in Haiti and just got accepted to NYU Business School in Abu Dhabi. So this is the power, this is the power of these thinkers to connect the human elements of compassion, of empathy with students to learn that are disrupting business models. And I think we're only at the beginning of this and that's why I believe feminine values, these skills and competencies are in ascendance. They're not only guiding how millennials think, they're guiding new business models, and they're guiding new ways to think about politics, science, and education. I'll touch on maybe uh, two more real briefly. We spent some time um, up in Sweden. It was a very progressive, interesting um, society, but we met the head of tourism there. Her name was Maria Ziv. And Maria was in charge of tourism for Sweden. And like me, who's a researcher, they did their own research. And when they went around the world, they asked people, what do you think of Sweden? The top two things that came back in their research were blonde people and ABBA. <laughs> and I kind of started to think, I was like, yeah, that sounds, that kind of makes sense. But what they were struggling with is if you're gonna go and put glossy magazine tourism brochures about come visit Sweden and people already think they know everything there is to know about Sweden, you know, how are you gonna really get people to change their minds? So I thought they did something really remarkable. They went to the government of Sweden and they asked for the at Sweden Twitter handle. So if you're on Twitter, this is a great account to follow. It's called at Sweden, like the country name. And they gave over the responsibility to tweet on behalf of the country to one citizen each week. Huge opportunity, right? Huge obligation. And so it started off really well and yet then a couple of citizens said some things that were very inappropriate, very hurtful. And rather than the government step in, ordinary citizens sort of retweeted these people back into submission. So it was a, just an interesting experiment on transparency, on accountability, and sort of on, on human integrity. And so I guess those were kind of the models that we saw all over the world. We saw a lot of you know, startups, a lot of interesting thinkers that had the courage of their own convictions to not do things the way that they're normally done. And I get a lot of questions from people, well, is this a book about soft skills? And I'm like, these people were not soft, right? These people were dealing with really difficult, intractable challenges. We were in Colombia, you know, a very difficult uh, situation in Colombia, yet Colombia is, is on ascendance. This is a country that's really tackling their problems. And in part because they're thinking in a different way. We met the head of the secretary of the Medellin um, city council who's responsible for all government spending. There they are spending two thirds of their budget for the next 10 years on people under 30. And they're doing that to break these cycles of violence and, and the other sort of civil challenges that have existed in society. So we saw very interesting thinkers around the world, but they had this courage. And I'll, I'll touch on one last quick story, but one of the more remarkable Athena thinkers that we met was this guy named Dr. Ayad Madish. And he was in Berlin, and he's the founder of a, of a startup called ResearchGate. And he's got a, a PhD in virology at Harvard, right? He's a really smart guy. But he was super humble. When I met with him, he kind of kept looking down, and, and every time I would like compliment him on his business, he would just go, oh, it's, it's, it's everyone around me. It's, it's all my, my, my partners that are doing all the great work. He was just this really humble guy. And I asked him, I said, so how did this idea come about? And he said he was going around to his colleagues at Harvard, and he kept getting stuck in his experiments as a medical researcher. And his colleagues started to chastise him. They said, you know, why are you admitting you don't know something? You actually look kind of foolish. And he was just being practical. He's a scientist. He thought, if I could find someone to help me figure out something in a shorter period of time, that would be good for my, my pursuits. And so he got frustrated, so frustrated with the egos in science that he went to Berlin and created this startup, ResearchGate. So fast forward five years later, 
He has two million scientists from 200 different countries collaborating on 800,000 different research projects. Because you know what? He found a whole bunch of scientists that were just like him. They were vulnerable, they were open and humble, and they wanted to learn. And that's a real theme in the Athena Doctrine, is this desire to help each other, but to also realize that you, you yourself don't have all the answers. And so he's created this enormous movement of scientific research. And when I asked him what he wants to do with this, he said, I want to crowdsource a Nobel Prize. Right? I want to have a Nobel Prize where the scientists scroll like the credits at the end of a movie. And so that's a different way of thinking. Right? It's moving from me to we, which is really what this is about, the, you know, the, the networks that you are building here with Athena. But it's also about realizing that we need to be more open and honest about our strengths, about our weaknesses. We need to bring humility into the way that we think because we're going to find ways to connect with other people. And that's what Dr. Manish did. He was humble, he was vulnerable, and he is disrupting science because he's got a whole bunch of other people that came in to help him because they want to do the same exact thing. So I think these are the types of networks that we're seeing emerge, right? Gone are going to be the days, in my opinion, of command and control, top-down hierarchy. But it's also not going to be chaos, right? You still need, as a leader, you need to be decisive, you need to take charge at times, but you also need to be more inclusive. And so what we see as we travel the world were these incredible women and some enlightened men, a few good men, um, as I put it, that are actually realizing that times are changing and that these are huge opportunities to, to lead and connect in the future. So, you know, I hope you en enjoy the book. Um, I hope you get a chance to, to skim through parts of it. Um, it's a really important to us in New York, um, in America, to support this book because all of our royalties and profits go to the United Nations Foundation Girl Up campaign. It's www.girlup.org. And if you can check it out, it's, it's an incredible organization, but it's teaching esteem um, in young girls and now a few boys that we've been able to bring into the organization to really think about leading in a different way. And the other thing we're doing is I'm a fellow at Barnard College at the Athena Center for Leadership. We're designing corporate workshops. So men and women can come together and learn to be more effective modern leaders simply by taking the tests that are in the Athena Doctrine about what it takes to be a modern leader and building out workshops around, around those issues. So I think it's a, personally a really exciting time to be in business, it's an exciting time to think about change, and I think the leaders that are gonna shape the future of tomorrow are gonna be these people that are thinking in a more feminine way. And a, a last point on this, my hope honestly is that we know, never have to talk about gender, we don't have to talk about men versus women, but the reality is it's still so tilted to these masculine structures that we need to put a dent in it. And one of the ways to do that, I think, is to celebrate these values, but for men to reframe them in a slightly different way. Because I think we can advocate for women and girls by focusing on the fact that men should get involved because if they think more like this way, it's a new form of competitive advantage. It's a new form to navigate change in the, in the months and years ahead. So with that, I'll open it up to any questions. But again, I really appreciate your, your time and, and attendance today. And, and thank you very much for having me. Hi, welcome to the National Goodness Choice uh, Online News. And today we have Mr. John Grisma, uh, uh, for the author of the Athena Doctrine. And he's going to tell us more about it. Uh, Mr. John, uh, welcome to our show. Thank you very much. And uh, John, tell us though, uh, how important is this book to you? And how, what would you like to tell our audience uh, about this book in three key points. Well, on a personal level, the book is really important to me because I'm a, uh, a dad of a, of a 10 year old girl and I see incredible opportunities for, for women in the future. But this book is really about an emergent form of leadership that aligns to a new economy, an economy that's focused on sharing, collaborating, and being more interdependent, as well as being more transparent. So I guess I, I'd say sort of the three takeaways uh, out of the book are the essence of the modern leader is becoming more feminine and there's big opportunities for both men and women who can think in a more in a more feminine way. The second thing is that there's this big focus right now on retaining the ethos of being a student, which is sort of setting aside your ego and your stature and your status and realizing that the world is constantly changing and there are huge opportunities to continue to, to learn and thrive. And I guess I'd say, sorry. And so, uh, 
what's next uh, for the future of women? What do you see? The, because the, the world now, right now has more women uh, entering the workforce and in, in leadership positions. So do you see that women are going to play a important role? Women are going to play a far more important role in the future, but also their skills and competencies what we saw in our research and in our interviews around the world was that there were very enlightened men as well that were thinking in a more feminine way. And um, what this book I think is really about is big opportunities for women in the future. Um, your foreign minister I think recently was on TV speaking about the fact that only 7% of women in Singapore serve on corporate boards. That number is equally low in America, it's somewhere around 15-16%. But that's really at odds with the marketplace, right? Women purchase or influence nearly 80% of products. So, you know, that rising influence needs to be taken into account by companies. Now, what would be the key advice for policymakers around the world and even uh, corporate boards uh, should do to make a change to allow women uh, to play the, the role that they should be playing? Well, I think first it's about inclusivity. It's about being more inclusive and being more diverse, thinking about the valuable contributions that women can bring into strategic challenges that, that a corporation or a, or a politician or, a, or a, any sort of, sort of political movement needs to really face and understand. So I think there's a big emphasis right now on bringing in those skills and values, and that's what we saw in our research around the world. If you have a mag magic wand and you could <laughs> wish, uh, wish something to come to come to pass uh, into reality for the women around the world, what would be the one wish? Well, I believe, and what we emphasize in this book, is that the way to advocate for women and girls is for men to model their approach. So we're framing feminine values and skills as a form of innovation, as a form of competitive advantage. And my hope then is that men and women will be far more uh, adroit and, and collaborative partners, and there'll be less of an issue on gender, more of a focus on, on just being people. Last question, and that is, uh, as a New York Times bestseller, The Altina Dot Train, uh, could you tell us what will be the one uh, advice that you like to tell the whole world about this wonderful book that you've written? I, I just hope that people will read it and check it out, but it is about managing change. It's about focusing on leadership for the future and the skills and ideas that we gathered from traveling all around the world, 18 countries, interviewing 100 different leaders. We think there's great insight and, and opportunity for anyone, anyone who aspires to be a leader at any level. What's next uh, for you, sir? Boy, just writing a book and, and getting out and uh, supporting it is, uh, is a, an effort in and, of, in and of itself. But one of the things I'm focused on is advocating for the rights of women and girls. And all proceeds of this book support the United Nations Foundation Girl Up campaign which is a tremendous campaign focusing on, on helping uh, girls become leaders. And so that's a big uh, emphasis of uh, mm -hmm. my focus and my time right now, mm -hmm. as well as corporate consulting. And how, and how can our viewers uh, find out more information and make a contribution towards uh, your cause? Absolutely. So the, the campaign is called www.girlup.org. And they're part of the United Nations Foundation. Or you can get more information on my website, which is John J. Sorry, J O H N G E R Z E M A. 